So these, these ETS events don't occur over the whole Cascadia at the same time, but patches of it go in some pattern, each patch having a somewhat regular uh, period to it. Well, this is a talk about earthquake prediction, so what has this got to do with it? Well, maybe nothing, but you could hypothesize that if indeed these are little backslip events, a little bit like an earthquake, but they take place slowly, and they do so someplace down there in the transition zone, just below the locked zone. So right there, you zero in and you put in one of these, these small earthquakes. Well, magnitude 6 isn't that small. Will that increase the stress on the lock zone just up dip such that it might push it over the edge past its, its failure point? It would then start ripping up the lock zone and then along the Cascadia fault zone generating your magnitude 9 earthquake. Now, like I said, this is a hypothesis. It's, we don't have much more evidence that this actually can occur other than it seems, it seems reasonable. But these ETS events occur on different places of the fault at different times, so which one is going to be the trigger, if any of them? Well, in other words, at this point, we can't use them for earthquake prediction. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about some of the things you may have heard about, because the press likes to pick up on this idea of being able to predict stuff. Uh, but these don't seem to work. We've talked about radon already, as I mentioned. It was studied in some detail. didn't seem to follow suit. So let's, let's don't include radon. Electromagnetic changes, there are a few cases where there are interesting anomalies that occur before an earthquake. But many other cases where there's earthquakes without such a phenomena and many places, times when you see these electrical changes and there are no earthquakes. So... If there is any relationship, it's far from understood now and is not a practical thing. Water level changes. There are several cases where they very definitely take place and likely due to something that occurred before an earthquake. But the hydrologic system in the earth is very complex, far from really understandable using our current technology. And so again, this doesn't... If, if somebody reports their water level changing, therefore there's going to be an earthquake, eh. I would, don't bet on it. Well, and the press loves animals, and so, of course, animal behavior always gets uh, a thing. Your, their cats are, cats are running loose, dogs are baying, uh, and all, or any number of reasons that might be. The most common type of phone call or, or email, sometimes somewhat abusive email, are from psychics or the equivalent that have pains here or headaches there, and they blame it on everything, including earthquakes, and say that they know that there's bad earthquakes coming, and they've heard it from, you know, from space aliens or something. So there's a huge range of those. I mean, just this morning, CNN had a report, because there seem to be a lot of earthquakes in California these days, well, there's aftershocks of the big one just in Mexico. Not big surprise. They interviewed Kate Hutton, who's a seismologist at at uh, Caltech, and she said, well, you know, we don't think there's any more earthquakes than normal if you remove these aftershocks. Um, we can't predict ones. We can't predict there won't be a big one tomorrow. Well, they used this little thing and, and sort of by asking her these questions made her sort of look a little bit stupid. Then they went to somebody in Florida who has a website up that shows ground temperatures over the state of California and claims that he predicts earthquakes based on that and that there's going to be a magnitude 5.7 somewhere in California in the next month. Well, you know, 5.7 is not that big. There could be. I mean, that's, but there's, there's nothing behind that. And this is what you might call your, your fair and balanced reporting of the, the news media sometimes seems to go. Well, what about things that, that may work? They, they may work maybe in the future. Uh, we've seen a few examples here that are hints that, they, that, that we may be sort of going in the, in the general right direction of increasing energy release. Uh, maybe there's a way we can actually measure the stresses near the faults. And there's a few techniques now that are starting to be developed that might go in that direction. Uh, indirect evidence of stress changes by by earthquake patterns. 
um, ETS. I sort of like that idea because we're, we've got it right under us here. Um, back to the, the earthquake in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in Italy, uh, L'Aquila earthquake, that generated such a big stir that the Italian government essentially got together an international commission to study the state of the art of earthquake prediction now. And they spent quite a bit of time sort of going through a lot of the types of things I've just mentioned here in a lot of detail. And the bottom line is still uh, deterministic prediction of earthquakes is not possible at this time. They do have caveats on that. That is forecast, that's the statistical changes that may be recognized due to different patterns of seismicity or some of these, these, these other things I've mentioned should be looked at in a much more sort of broader, more rigorous manner to see if there is some way that these statistical variations that may give a hint of the slightly more likely or slightly less likely can be used in a socially useful way. But at this point, that's, that, that, that's really not the case. Well, I said I would talk about early warning, so I'm going to quickly uh, jump to that. There's a couple of different ways that that, that works. Uh, one that we've just seen now, of course, is a volcano starts erupting. Ash is going into the air. You can use that information right off to warn away aircraft. And you can warn them away and warn them away and drive everybody nuts because they're not flying for a long period of time. Well, aircraft are exceedingly vulnerable to volcanic ash in their engines. And so that's really, unfortunately, the wise thing to do. Tsunamis, large earthquakes generate tsunamis. And we saw just a few, uh, a month or so ago, the Chile earthquake generated a Pacific-wide tsunami. We heard a lot about the fact that the tsunami wave in uh, Hawaii was sort of a non-event. Well, it, it turns out it was the size of the tsunami there was sort of at the, at the lower level of what they predicted in a conservative manner. And it wasn't enough to do very much damage, but other places in the Pacific it did. We didn't hear so much about that, but you know, there was lots of damage from that, that tsunami in that case. But what about large earthquakes? Once an earthquake starts, their seismic waves are radiated, and they travel at a pretty fast velocity, but at a, at a, at a finite one. So if we had a big earthquake someplace, can we warn cities at some distance that that shaking is occurring? What I'm going to do is show you sort of the, the best case where this might work. And it is right here in the Pacific Northwest. Again, our favorite place, the locked zone, in this case, goes in a big earthquake. And it rips the whole distance from northern California to southern British Columbia. 